Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this, the fourth in the series of the President's Dream Colloquium on Understanding Medical Cannabis. I see we've changed the name from medical marijuana to medical cannabis. So we're all, we're all learning something, even the organizers, especially the organizers. I'm Peter Rubin. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Science here at Simon Fraser University and a professor in biomedical physiology and kinesiology. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, first, I want to remind everybody that there are two more speakers after today, and I encourage everybody to come. They're all going to be great. Also, don't forget to visit our website. And this lecture, as with all the other lectures, are uh, live streamed and will be archived for viewing later on. I want to be sure to thank our sponsors, and in particular, Afaria, who's here today. Thank you very much, our major sponsor for the day. So it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mark Ware. Dr. Ware is a clinical scientist at McGill University, where he holds the position of associate professor in the departments of family medicine and anesthesia. He's director of clinical research at the Allen Edwards Pain Management Unit at McGill University Health Center. And in addition, Dr. Ware was the vice chair of Canada's task force on cannabis legalization and regulation. So, he knows of what he speaks. Dr. Ware received his undergraduate degree from Queen's University and then went on to do his medical training at the University of West Indies in finishing in 1992 in his native Jamaica. He moved to McGill University in 1999 and there became one of the very few recipients in Canada of federal funding to study the effects of cannabis on pain. As one who understands how difficult it is to get federal funding at all, much less federal funding to study the potential health effects of illegal substances, I have great appreciation for the profound significance of Dr. Ware's achievement in securing these funding. Now, I could go on, and this slide goes on, extolling the virtues of Dr. Ware's eminence in the field of cannabis research, but you came here to listen to him and not me. So I'll close again by thanking the sponsors for the colloquium, and in particular, today's major sponsor, Aferia Incorporated, producers of medicinal cannabis. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Ware. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, thank you to Simon Fraser for inviting me to this amazing series of speakers, and I'm, I'm humbled to join some of my old friends and some very eminent speakers in this colloquium series, so congratulations to Simon Fraser for the for the foresight, because this must have taken years to plan, knowing how big a topic this was going to be in 2017, uh, took quite an advancement of foresight. So thank you, uh, and thank you to the team for, for making my transition here so smooth today. Uh, and thank you for taking time out of a wet Vancouver Thursday afternoon to come here. And if you're at home in your pajamas watching this, then welcome to you too. Um, so I'm going to begin with some disclosures just to, to clear the air. I have, uh, I have a number of associations, and, and Peter mentioned my academic affiliations, but I run a nonprofit organization called the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, for which I receive a small stipend. Uh, I have a grant at my institution from one of the licensed producers to run a clinical trial, and I've just recently started a small consulting company, and I'm doing some consulting for, for small and large pharma companies in Canada and the U.S., but what I'd like to do today <clears throat> is to talk a little bit about truth. There's a lot of talk about truth in the media these days and south of the border and alternate facts. Um, but I want us to think about what we think we know about cannabis and to think about how we can get to the truth about cannabis. And I'm going to begin that by talking about stories. 
and the importance of stories in, in understanding the truth. And then I'd like to do a little bit of a sort of a dive into pain and the nature of pain and what we understand about it. Then I'll bring the science story into the picture and talk a bit about cannabinoids and analgesia and why we think these drugs have effects in, in pain patients. And then come back to wrap up with a little bit of a, a, a philosophy about looking for truth about cannabis again. So with that, let me start. <clears throat> and I think we'll begin with a story that, like all good stories, should begin on a beach in Jamaica. Uh, and when people find out that I did my undergraduate training in, in Jamaica, they often think, oh, of course, that makes sense. Now you're in the pot research thing. And in fact, I grew up in Jamaica. I spent my childhood there. And my parents, we lived in Kingston, and we had a little uh, cottage, essentially a place that we would go to. And it's up, way up there on the hill. Like one of these little condos was our it was our country place, if you like. And we would go up there every weekend. And my brother and I would play on this beach. And I know every end of this beach backwards. We, every weekend we were on there. And uh, the story I'm going to tell you is, you know, I'm going to call it the tale of two Rastas. Because one day, Stephen and I decided we were going to swim out to this little island out here. And that's a fairly good swim for a couple of kids at seven and eight years old. And we swam out there. And when we got to this little island, it's deserted. It's a completely magical little desert island, and, and it was our kind of hiding place. But we got out there, and there on the little beach in front of the island was this old Rastafarian man sitting cross-legged on the sand, meditating. And we were you know, curious. We went up to him and said, yeah, what you doing, Doc? What you doing, boss? And, and he opened his eyes, and he looked up, and he goes, I'm just having eye citations. And that word, eye citations, was, I'd never heard it before. I looked it up on Google the other day. It doesn't even exist. But this, so he was having, and if you speak Rasta, you understand that eye citations wasn't hallucinations, it was insight. It was, he was having some kind of profound communication with some spiritual experience that he was having. That, you know, I'm seven and eight years old with my brother, we've swam back, and we're like, okay, that was cool. So that's Rasta number one. My first experience with kind of a cannabis-induced euphoric state. And... Growing up in Jamaica, you spend a lot of time uh, driving around, going from place to place, and I remember the smell, driving at home late at night, especially when we were coming back from up north, back to Kingston, driving through these little tiny villages, and, and you'd go through the town, and it's dark, and they had music set up. They'd have huge speakers set up in the villages, and you'd drive through these towns, and you'd hear the sound of the music pulsing. You'd smell the chicken cooking, and there was this other smell that used to drift into the car from time to time. And it became, as I, you know, as I grew up, I realized this was the smell of ganja. And then fast forward about 30 years, I'm working in Kingston at a sickle cell clinic, and I meet an elderly Rastafarian patient who at that time was beyond what we published as the expected life expectancy of patients with sickle cell anemia. We just published a paper suggesting that they live to be about late 50s, and this guy was in his early 70s and looking really good. And I said, you know, what's your secret? How do you manage to live so long and so well? And again, old Rasta man looks me in the eyes and he says, Doc, you must study the herb. <laughs> I citations, herb. So you get the picture now. So, I'm, so this time, I'm in a position, I'm working in a sickle cell clinic, I'm at the University of the West Indies, I go back to my boss and I go, okay, God, can, you know, cannabinoids, pain. Went looking it up in the literature and realized that there was this huge story evolving. This is in 1998. And sort of that began my experience. And colored with that background and that childhood, I think we all have to recognize that we come to cannabis with a certain element of prejudgment. We've all had experiences with it. Um, and, or of it, um, and I think especially, you know, these days, I think people are becoming more and more aware of cannabis through the media and through social media. So we're all coming into discovering and discussing cannabis with our own particular perspectives. And, and so let me jump from stories to data. This is particularly important. This study was done in Colorado in 2013, and they asked family physicians in Colorado what was the main reason that either assisted them in helping patients get access to cannabis or prevented them from getting access to cannabis. And the number one reason that they chose to either support or not support a, a request to support cannabis use was patient experience, experiences with patients. Either they had negative experience with patients, in which case they weren't likely to authorize, or they had positive experiences with patients, in which case they were likely. 
So the stories that we hear, the experiences that we have with cannabis, either they're positive or negative, drive a great deal of what we think and how we behave around this drug. So I want us to all stop and think about why we think the way we do. What is it about this experience that we've had in our personal stories that's governed the experience that we have? And I think it also helps to explain why some of the responses and the reactions that we hear from communities where they see a lot of harm from cannabis, that's because the stories and the realities that they're living are very different from people whose lives are being helped by cannabis. And we are fools to ignore the realities that these two sides or these multiple perspectives have and the truths that they bring. So, I don't know if anybody knows who this guy is, but speaking of stories, uh, John Lennon, anyone know who that is? That's Alan Rock. Now, Alan Rock was a lawyer in the late 1960s, early 1970s, who famously spent a couple of days driving John Lennon around in a VW uh, Beetle. And I'm willing to bet that the stories that he experienced back in those days were influential in his decision in 1999 to open Canada's first medical marijuana access program. And he was the Minister of Health that first launched the research programs and the funding, which I was fortunate enough to be able to access. So I owe a debt of gratitude to Alan Rock, but I suspect he owes a debt of gratitude to the Beatles. So moving forward a little bit to the early 1970s, Lester Grinspoon, the Harvard psychiatrist, began to think about cannabis slightly differently. He was beginning to recognize that this drug was being demonized and needed to be, to be thought of in a different light. And he published this book in 1971 called Marijuana Reconsidered. And this is also, a, a, fundamentally, a collection of stories. And this is one of the books that changed my perspective on, on cannabis very fundamentally, because there are stories in there about how people used cannabis and it had very interesting and powerful effects on their lives. And one of them is a story of a geologist who was working with these two-dimensional images of, of substrata imaging. And I, I won't do justice to the, to the story, but they, they were faced with these issues of looking at pictures and trying to figure out what the three-dimensional structure of the underground things that they were ultrasounding and so on. And this is, you know, we're talking late, or late 60s, early 70s. And one day he smoked cannabis in the evening and he was looking at how he was working on this problem and he smoked some cannabis. And suddenly he looked at the pictures and he was able to merge them in his mind and look at this three-dimensional thing. And he realized he'd solved the problem under the influence of cannabis. Running around his room, you can imagine the excitement. He suddenly cracked this problem that he'd been struggling with. And he goes back and he starts to, the next day, thinking, okay, well, when it wears off, I won't be able to do this anymore. And, and sure enough, he could. And he went to his lab and he started training people. And he cracked a very, very critical problem in his lab, in his world, by while under the influence of cannabis. And these, this book is filled with stories like that, about life-changing moments that cannabis induced in these patients. So again, I want to just remind us that stories are very powerful and, and have tremendous value in the way that we consider and the way that we've shaped our perspective on cannabis today. The reality is that stories aren't enough. Um, and Canada's context has been shaped very much uh, more by legal challenges than it has by science. Uh, and so I put this up as a kind of sample of a, a cannabis knowledge spiral. But this is very much like the Canadian reality, where the human experience, the patients, the stories, the exposure, uh, was the basis of the whole story leads to legal challenges against the prohibition pre regimes and against the laws that were preventing them from accessing cannabis. Uh, the political response to those legal challenges has been you know, at different times, different uh, levels of, 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 uh, uh, of acceptability. Uh, research has at best been a side effect of some of this work. Uh, back to the human experience, and then, of course, net more legal challenges. And, and those of you who know the work of John Conroy uh, will be aware, of, and Alan Young will be well aware of the impact that these legal challenges have had on the political reality and, in fact, the shape of our, uh, of our, uh, our reality today, but all fundamentally based on, on human stories and human experience. So let me switch gears a little bit and talk a bit about pain. And we all know what pain is. Every single one of us has experienced pain, and thankfully we have, because it's important in our survival. But we've often, we probably haven't thought carefully about what pain means, what, what defines pain. And, and I belong to a, an international association that studies pain, and they spent years trying to define pain, and this is the best that they could come up with. 
And it still stands today as the single most sort of succinct description of what pain means. And, and there's some key words. Unpleasant, you know, yeah, get that. Sensory, you feel it with your senses. And emotional, experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or expressed in terms of such damage. The key word here is the emotional experience. We all probably know pain as a physical sensory thing, but we forget that patient, patients with chronic pain have a tremendous emotional reaction to pain, uh, especially the longer it goes on. Um, the model that we use for pain typically is quite linear. We injure ourselves. We have a whole host of nerves that detect the kind of injury. We have specialized nerves for touch, vibration, heat, uh, tickle, itch. These all pick up the sensation at the periphery, and then they travel up by a nerve to the spinal cord. And in the spinal cord, the nerve ends and transitions to another nerve. And that message, that synapse, where the two nerves have to talk to each other, is very, very important in the way that that message of pain is transmitted. Because it then goes across the spinal cord up to the midbrain, and at the midbrain, it synapses again. There's another junction, and a third nerve takes that message up to the top of your brain, the sensory cortex, where you experience the phenomenon of pain. And you also know where the pain is coming from. It's mapped onto your body and the brain's image of your body. Well, what we've begun to realize now is that pain is, a, is very much more complex than this sort of linear pathway. And it's complicated by these different junctions at the spinal cord and the thalamus. When the message reaches the brain, it also branches off into other areas. It goes into areas that affect memory. It goes into areas that affect your mood. It goes into areas that affect your emotion. So that anger at yourself for slamming your hand on the, or your, your thumb with your hammer is an angry emotional reaction. It's not just a physical sensation. And this is because these nerve cells activate huge ranges of the brain when you're in pain. And this happens with acute pain, and it also happens when pain has been persisting for a very long time. When you've had chronic pain, the changes start happening in the spinal cord. The chemicals that are used to transmit the message start to change. The receptors that receive those signals start to upregulate, downregulate. The areas of the brain start to change. In fact, we even know now that structures in the brain start to increase or decrease in size if you've had pain for a long period of time. And fortunately, what we're learning is that if you treat the pain successfully, those structural changes can be reversible. The fact remains that it has a profound impact on our nervous system. As a clinician treating pain, we have a challenge with chronic pain. And by chronic, I mean pain that's gone on for longer than about six months. Most of us have dealt with acute pain. And most of us have access to medications which are quite good at treating acute pain. We can take a Tylenol, we can take an Advil, we have good. And these all work on that very inflammatory and that very nociceptive soup that I was describing in that simple pathway. Where we run into difficulties is with the chronic pain state, because of all the changes that take place, that these Chronic pain problems don't respond to drug treatment very effectively. And we've thrown all kinds of medications at them, and some work, some don't. They usually have side effects. So patients living with pain for a long period of time really are difficult to treat with just simple pharmacotherapy. In fact, we start to use drugs that aren't even considered as classical painkillers anymore. We start treating them with antidepressants, not because they're depressed, but because the pain mechanisms have changed so that these antidepressants are working on pain pathways that weren't present when the pain was acute. We use anticonvulsants, drugs used for epilepsy. We start using them for pain. Um, we start using medications uh, stronger and stronger. We start using drugs like ketamine and lidocaine and uh, methadone and, and opioids because we're struggling to get control of the pain. So pain as an experience becomes very complex. It affects mood, it affects sleep, and I call this the pain triad, pain, mood, and sleep, as the primary uh, outcomes. And a patient presenting to me with pain, I was on the radio this afternoon, and someone said, well, so somebody comes to you in pain, and you know, why don't you give them marijuana? And that's such a simplistic picture. Somebody coming with pain needs to be listened to, first of all. They need to explain their story. We teach a course at McGill called Narrative Medicine, which is teaching people the art of listening actively, um, not interrupting. Doctors are notorious for interrupting you. Within nine seconds, on average, a doctor will interrupt when you start. You know, Tell me about your pain. Well, it began, okay, when was that again? 
interruption right away, looking for that fact. We teach students to wait, listen. It takes about seven minutes for a typical patient to tell their story. And usually they're looking at their watch going, okay, how much longer do I have? Okay, I better get this wrapped up. And if you just sit with your pen down and listen, the story emerges. And in that story, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and an end. And it's different for every patient. And they're telling you in their narrative the story that they want you to hear. And if we don't listen, if we don't get that, we don't realize how the pain is affecting their family life, their sex life, their mood, their job, their kids, themselves. We let that come out. Then we go back at the end and fill in the blanks. So assessing a chronic pain patient is really a very special thing to try and do. I began at the McGill Pain Clinic in the early, well, late 1990s, early 2000s, and I had patients coming reporting using cannabis. And this is, again, the time Alan Rocks launched the program. Regulations are changing. There's a whole movement now to allowing cannabis access for patients. And so we had a few patients coming in saying that they were using it. And I, went, I was telling the story to the students earlier, but I went through a tremendously complicated process just to be allowed to ask the patients why they were using cannabis, how much, when, because we really didn't know. And what we found was, lo and behold, patients used cannabis predominantly, and this is 15 subjects, very tiny, tiny study, pain, mood, and sleep were the big three things that patients use cannabis to help. And in some cases, they're sort of more or less equivalent. The pain and the mood factors were, were similar. Some patients, were, the mood was worse, and others said different things. But a very tiny little paper. But it was the first time that I started to hear patients say, you know what, it's, it's not just the pain, but it helps me manage the pain, helps me sleep a little better, and, and, and I don't use very much. And this was the key thing that helped me in designing trials, because from here we went on to design clinical trials to, eva to evaluate this effect. But it was that report that they didn't need to use very much that was really interesting to me. At the same time, Scientists were discovering the cannabinoid receptors, and I imagine you've heard a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, and I won't go into this in any detail, because you've had better speakers than I explain these things to you. But what we recognized in the pain world was that these receptors, especially the CB1 receptor, was clustered very tightly in areas of the brain that are really important in pain management. And I mentioned to you earlier that network of brain regions that gets activated when someone's in acute or chronic pain. Well, the cannabinoid receptors were exactly where you would want something to be that was affecting pain. Not just pain, but anxiety, stress, emotion, and fear. Um, the challenge with cannabinoids is that they're also in many other areas, so memory feeding, addiction, movement. I mean, this may be helpful for epilepsy and for other areas, but from a pain perspective, the challenge was how do we harness this system to help these patients managing their pain? And it looked like we were in the right area, but it was a question of how do we apply the drug safely? The animal scientists had been looking at cannabinoids since the early 1990s. And I began to look at the animal literature and say, OK, well, is there anything we can learn from that? And wh what I learned and what I took away from the animal literature was that cannabinoids were effective in every single pain model that they could design and throw at it, from neuropathic pain, all the different neuropathy models that were done. And they used these to test and screen for drug compounds that they're going to take on and develop as pharmaceutical agents. This is the, the pathway. You use these models to find a new drug that you're then going to go on and develop. All the pain models. Cannabinoids are very effective in, in pain models. Spinal cord injury, MS, chronic pain, visceral pain, beautiful results in, in animal studies. And it seemed like every paper I read finished by saying, you know, we need human clinical trials. Much easier said than done. We went through a process. I, I had an amazing team of researchers who came together and agreed that we would try and get funding for a clinical trial of smoked cannabis for neuropathic pain. We felt this was the condition. The patients had said that it helped them. We designed the study in such a way that we would measure pain and mood and sleep. We designed the study in such a way to use relatively small doses. And I remember when we published the, 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 the initial funding and people realized what we were proposing to do, I, there was tremendous pushback from the activists saying, oh, these guys are deliberately underdosing patients because they want to show that it doesn't work. I had all kinds of pushback from, from the community saying you are underdosing patients. But patients have been telling me that, you know what, I take a puff or two, I put my joint out and I wait a few hours and I'm good to go. And I thought, well, if we're worried about safety, let's, let's start there. So we had to get the hospital to build a smoking room. 
Uh, and I'm pleased to say that I have to give credit to the Montreal General and the McGill University Health Center and all the people that I worked with. I could tell stories about the, the first time going in there saying, I want to set up a lab to smoke marijuana. You would have expected to be laughed out of the room. But uh, Phil Gold, who is a, a professor emeritus, he's, a, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's royalty in Montreal, heard me say this and took me by the hand and took me around the hospital, introduced me to every single person that I needed to know to make that happen in the course of about two hours. It was incredible. I was just in his shadow. Mark Ware is going to study hash. Mark Ware is going to study hash. You're going to help him out. Oh, and as long as Phil Gold said it was going to happen, it was good. So we built a smoking room. Ray up here in the top corner. You can see it's actually in use at the moment in this picture. <laughs> But no word of a lie, it, it, it is actually, it was on the top corner. We had it originally on one side of the building, it was on the other side, but it was like this. And we got complaints from the nurses who had their lunchroom right above it, because we were ventilating out this way. And we didn't actually get to do it, because as soon as they heard that this Dr. Ware smoking study was going to be happening on the floor below them with the ventilation out, they said, well, we don't want to get smoke coming into our thing. So, Lo and behold, they gave us the top floor and the top very far corner of the whole hospital. We ran this study for, I don't know, three years. I don't think anybody in the hospital ever knew that there was cannabis smoking going on up there. It was, we did it so discreetly and so carefully. The clinic was happening all around us, and people never knew that patients were going in and out, and coming out having expo been exposed to smoke cannabis. So some great stories, but the, 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 the bottom line was we finally completed the trial and published it in the CMAJ. Um, so just to give you some numbers, 25 milligrams of herbal cannabis, which is a very, very small amount. Anybody who knows anything about doses of cannabis will realize 25 milligrams is almost the tip of a teaspoon. So you just, you know, salt. You just put that much salt on your, on your dinner. So 25 milligrams. Well, we, we kept the dose the same, and we changed the amount of THC. So we had a placebo condition. We had a 2.5% THC, a 6%, and a 9.4% THC. So they used the same 25 milligrams. We put it in little gelatin capsules that they could then open up, tip into this pipe. So there's the pipe from Mori Designs. I don't know what happened to the company, but we actually had them. I chose it because it was medical looking. Um, and because they could provide me with the building specs that allowed us to get it approved as a medical device. By the, by the Therapeutic Products Directorate. So we got that approved as a medical device. We gave them capsules with this uh, 25 milligrams of these different products. They were randomized, so they didn't know which one they were getting. Three times a day, for five days, they used one of these different things. And then they washed out for a week. They didn't use anything. They came back, and they got another bottle of capsules. The first one was always done in the hospital, right up in that little room that I showed you earlier. And then the rest of them they took home with their pipe, and then three times a day, they opened the capsule, they tipped the 25 milligrams, single inhalation, they held their breath for five seconds, and then they exhaled. Three times a day, one puff. And what happened? Well, one of the first things we found was that there was really nice pharmaco pharmacokinetics. And, and this is where I'm going to get really sort of science geeky on you, but here's the time in minutes. So this is zero minutes, that's five minutes. Then I change the scale a little bit because it otherwise gets boring, but 10, 15, 20 minutes, 40 minutes. So one hour is here, that's two hours, three hours. Look at the peak effect of THC in the blood at 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. This is the level of THC in your blood. At 9.4%, you get about 50 nanograms per ml. At 6%, it was about 20 nanograms. At 2.5, it was less. And luckily, the placebo, there was no THC. So patients weren't using anything else apart from the study drug. That was important. But these patients on the 9.4%, one puff three times a day, reported that their pain and their sleep was significantly improved compared to the placebo group and compared to these other groups. So this was just enough to get an analgesia. But what was really interesting, in the entire study, very few, there were three episodes of euphoria, patients reporting getting high. The rest of the patients never reported high as a side effect because we were using such small doses. And so the takeaway message for me for this study was you can achieve pain control with using small doses of cannabis if you learn to just take that single inhalation and wait. I think a lot of people tend to smoke more than they need to just because of the habit or they, you know, they've got a whole joint, so they take a few puffs. But what also happens is the blood levels happen very quickly. One to two minutes, they peak. Uh, but the, the effects of the drug actually don't start to happen until about 10 to 15 minutes, by which time you've smoked 9, 
smoke puffs, or you've smoked three puffs, or you smoke more than you need, then the effect starts to gain. Take the, so we start teaching patients, take one puff and wait half an hour, see what happens. And lo and behold, I think we found that they were actually surprised at how much pain relief there was. So it's one thing to do a study in one place and find it. Then an Israeli group about six years later uh, updated the technology, changed a little bit of the, uh, the delivery system, um, and this time, these guys used 15 milligrams. We're now talking tiny doses of cannabis, but they doubled the THC level, so we're now talking a very tiny smidgen of a 20% THC product, vaporized using an inhaler. Oops, well, there's a big picture of it. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen like that, but there's the vaporizer. Um, and what was remarkable was that they found exactly the same pharmacokinetics that we found. And these are the same levels, same numbers as the 9.4. So 25 milligrams of 9.4%, do the math, 15 milligrams of 19%, almost the same amount of THC per dose. Same pharmacology, same result. Neuropathic pain patients reported improvement in their pain. And, and they're continuing to develop that product and moving forward. So, Low, low doses or small doses, changing the level of THC, maybe you can use, if you have more THC, you can use less product. But that single puff seemed to be an interesting finding. But it wasn't just us. Over the 2000s, there were a tremendous number of people looking at cannabinoids in pain. And these are pharmaceutical or herbal products that have been studied in different pain conditions, from fibromyalgia to spinal cord injury to spasticity from MS, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer pain, and the neuropathies. So, and you look at the dates of all of these studies. This is all happening since 2004 to 2015, 2016. So this is a decade when we started to see clinical trials reporting, uh, reporting the benefits of cannabis in pain. Now, I don't want to continue too much further without making sure that you recognize that we, as the clinicians doing this research, recognize the safety considerations. And you have to understand that for me to get an approval from a federal agency to get money to do a study of smoked cannabis, I had to prove to them that I wasn't going to cause cancer, I wasn't going to cause them to drive off the road, I wasn't going to cause them to go psychotic. All of these health issues had to be addressed in the consent forms, in the design of the study, in the way we captured the data. So I'm well aware of the potential, uh, potential harms. In fact, so much so that the second federal grant that we got was to study the safety of cannabis when used for the management of pain. At that time, Health Canada had authorized uh, a company to cu cultivate cannabis. It was being distributed to patients. There were close to 1,000 patients, maybe more at that time, using cannabis from a legal supplier uh, under a legal regimen with a doctor's approval. And nobody was following them. Nobody was studying them. Nobody was understanding who they were, why they used it, how much they used it. Approached, I appealed to the funding agencies and said, we need to follow patients for a period of time to just see what they're doing and how, and are there safety considerations? So we began this study. We called it the COMPASS study. COMPASS, so doing clinical studies is fun because you get to name them, and thinking of a fun name for a study is a really good thing. COMPASS was neat because it kind of helped us think, well, where are we going? But it was also a nod to compassion. And so we wanted to recognize, we were looking at something which patients were using out of compassionate access and through compassionate programs. So we followed 215 patients using cannabis uh, for pain management. And these had to be patients that had tried and failed all other therapies. They were really severely debilitated pain. Didn't have to be neuropathic, could be any kind of pain, but we followed them for a year. We also followed from the same clinics, and there were seven clinics across the country. We followed 216 control patients, who were patients with severe pain, who were not cannabis users, didn't want to use cannabis. We followed them for the same one year as well. They were allowed to get all the best therapy that they were getting, but we followed them for the same period. They were allowed to use, the, the cases, the pe people using cannabis, were allowed to use as much cannabis as they wanted. Now imagine recruiting for a study where you can get as much cannabis as you want. They didn't pay for it. They didn't have to administer it. It came in from the supplier to the pharmacies. Seven hospitals across the country received huge volumes of cannabis, kept it in stored vaults in the right conditions, and dispensed it to patients 
at weekly intervals for the first month and then monthly intervals after that so that we could keep an eye on how much they were using, bring back the unwanted cannabis. I have to remind you, these aren't patients who were experienced heavy-duty cannabis users. These were chronic pain, very suffering patients. And what did we learn from following them? Well, one of the big takeaways was the doses that they were using. And remember, they weren't really constrained. They could use 5, 10 milligrams, uh, grams, excuse me, if they felt like it. There was some, we gave the physicians in the study some parameters to say, you know, people using over 5 grams, you might want to increase some of the safety monitoring. But the average dose, the median daily dose, was 2.5 grams per day. The THC content of the cannabis that we supplied to them is now getting up a little closer to, you know, street grade, 12.5% THC cannabis, which is a pretty strong material. No cannabidiol, so before anyone asks me about CBD, you'll notice that none of these studies in pain have already started looking at CBD yet. But they have THC of 12.5%. Only about 11 or 5% of the patients needed or asked for more than 3 grams a day. So this is the dosage. It still was quite striking because on one hand, I've done a study that shows that 25 milligrams three times a day is okay. Here they are with 100 times more, 2.5 grams a day. But these were patients using it in different forms. We didn't constrain them to smoking it. Uh, there weren't that many vaporizers back then, but they were cooking with it, baking with it. So they were allowed to use it in whatever way. And I, the paper contains all the information on that, but I won't go into it here. The main outcome was safety, serious adverse events, death, hospitalization, congenital abnormalities, um, anything that the physician felt was life-threatening. Uh, and the amazing thing was no difference between cannabis users and the control arm, who we followed over this time, no separation. S same level, there were people do have serious adverse events, they happen to all of us you know, at some point in our lives. Uh, but there was no difference in the rate that were happening in the cannabis users compared to the controls. But what we did see was a difference in the non-serious adverse event rates. So the cannabis users had more side effects than the control groups. But we had to now parse out these side effects. We had a special committee that was designed to look at all the side effects, and there were hundreds of them that we categorized, we, we labeled them depending on their severity, their seriousness, and then we looked at causality. And when we looked at causality, was this side effect potentially, probably, or pro possibly caused by the cannabis that the patient was using. These were the top five that came out as being most likely associated with cannabis. Drowsiness, forgetfulness, cough, nausea, and dizziness. Not exactly a sort of a whirlwind class cluster of serious and, uh, and severe side effects, but these were the ones that the panel determined. So again, in sort of giving patients advice, if you're going to use 2.5 grams of cannabis a day for a year, these are some of the side effects to look out for. One of the things that we did, which was quite novel and which raised a lot of eyebrows when we published it, was the cognitive function. We tested their cognitive function every six months, so six months and one year later. And we found that both the cannabis group and the control group improved their cognitive function over a one-year period. And these are serious chronic pain patients. So kind of a nice finding, and what was really intriguing was that we didn't find that even at that 2.5 grams a day dose, that the cannabis users did not show any decline in cognitive function. The fact that it actually improved over that one year was quite a remarkable thing. In fact, I buried it in the supplementary materials of the paper when I first submitted it, and the reviewers said, you got to put that in the main paper. That's a very important finding. So it got put into the main paper. Um, and I continue to have discussions with researchers now at Johns Hopkins and Harvard. We're trying to figure out how chronic pain and cannabis can actually change cognitive function in directions that you might think are different from what a recreational user may experience. So I want to come back a little bit to stories. That's a bit deep dive into the science of cannabinoid analgesia and some of the studies that we've done to get us there. Something that I hear a lot from patients, and I remember this from way, when I was beginning uh, at, the, at the pain clinic at Montreal, patients saying to me that it doesn't really take the pain away, but it takes me away from my pain. And there's a lot packed into that statement, but some of the recent neuroimaging studies that are coming out of places like the University of Oxford are actually showing how that can be. And I'm not qualified to give you a detailed breakdown, but I love brain imaging slides. Uh, and what these studies did was they actually separated out the analgesic response to a cannabinoid, THC, both on the intensity of the pain, but also on the unpleasantness of the pain, the bothersomeness. 
We've all had a pain, but you know, you can kind of deal with it. You rub it off and you, you can move on with it. But there are some pains that are just deeply unpleasant pains to have. Uh, and cannabinoids seem to help the unpleasantness of the pain. It didn't bother them as much. And they actually found the regions of the brain away from the sensory cortex, but down in the prefrontal cortex, which appeared to be responsible for this dissociation of the unpleasantness of the pain from the intensity of the pain. So science is now starting to actually understand not only that patients can import, report re reduced pain using small doses, but actually a mechanism by which that unpleasantness of the pain is justifiable based on brain imaging studies. A friend of mine called me up, you know, I tried cannabis for I have acute back pain. I tried it, didn't do anything, doc, you're full of shit. Cannabis doesn't work for acute pain. And this is a big study that came out a couple of months ago, and a systematic review of clinical trials looking at cannabinoids for acute pain. It really doesn't work. And people ask about why could that be if you've got all these receptors. It appears as though one of the reasons for this is that when you've had chronic pain for a long time, among those changes that happen at the synaptic level in the spinal cord and in the brain is a change in the way your cannabinoid receptors are expressed. So you actually have more cannabinoid receptors if you've had chronic pain. So maybe you're more receptive to this drug if you've had chronic pain. And it doesn't really do much for analgesia if you're not in chronic pain. It does other things, but it's not situated in the same pain regions uh, when you're healthy or not in pain than it is when you've had pain for a long time. So your body seems to prime to be cannabinoid receptive as you've had pain for a long time. I can't help but put this email up because I'm, I'm sort of quoting some, some sort of stories, but this is actually not a patient story. This is a physician who emailed me in November of last year, and I'm, you've all heard stories like this, so forgive me if I just read it out, but this was a, an older physician who had heard me talk at pain meetings about cannabis and cannabinoids and pain and followed the story for a while, and she was not somebody who really kind of took it on. She wasn't a, you know, a, a big advocate. She didn't really get it. But somewhere in the last few years of her practice, she started putting her patients, and I'll read, over the past year, I have put 40 patients on medical cannabis, usually oil, almost all with neuropathic pain. I am very impressed with its efficacy and utility as an opioid-sparing medication. I tell patients that once they are on the cannabis oil, I will help them slowly bring down their opioids. A very few have said it did nothing for them, but 90 to 95% have been helped tremendously. Now that's a story, it's an anecdote from a physician, one physician writing to another saying, okay, here's my experience. But we're actually hearing this now more and more from different parts of the country and different parts of, of North America. This study came out from the US where they looked at states that had medical cannabis laws and those that didn't. And they found reductions in opioid mortality in states that had medical cannabis laws compared to states that didn't. So this is another kind of picture of how patients are using cannabis in different ways and potentially reducing their opioids. What's really important here is that unlike my colleague who sent me the email before, these patients aren't being told to reduce their opioids. They're not being given a recipe or a, an instruction on how to do it. They're doing it by themselves. Um, and just recently, Zach Walsh uh, here in Okanagan and Philippe Lucas published this paper, again, asking patients about their experience. And this just came out, I think, yesterday. Uh, looking at patients using cannabis as a substitute for opioids and for benzodiazepines and other drugs. We're hearing this now more and more. Um, and I bring it up because I want to keep reminding you that that patient report is so important. If we're hearing this story, we have to respond to it. We have to take this and, and take it forward and understand it better. Another thing I hear, with patients telling me that, you know, when I exercise, I feel like my pain's better. Why is that? We teach patients with chronic pain about exercise and the importance of exercise and movement. We teach patients about the importance of relaxation and breathing and meditation. So these psychological, physical approaches fit very nicely with pharmacological approaches in a kind of triad, a three-way approach to the patient with chronic pain. And exercise is a critical part of that. It's not always easy to get patients with chronic pain to start being more active because it hurts. And they don't recognize that they need to keep that movement going in order to reduce their pain. But some really intriguing work about movement, exercise, and your cannabinoid system. 
So this paper, published by a good friend of mine, John McPartland and, and Jeffrey Guy, who set up a big pharmaceutical company on cannabinoids, Vincenzo de Marzo, who's just moved to Quebec to do some cannabinoid work. But your endogenous cannabinoid levels go up after you've been running for 30 minutes. They go up if you've been biking. They go up after strenuous hikes in the Vancouver mountains. They go up after you've had a massage. They go up after you've had an osteopathic adjustment. So, and, and, and the other thing is the omega-3s. Who knew that dietary omega-3s, you need those in your body to have these proper endogenous cannabinoid signaling. So we can start putting the cannabinoid story together, not just with using cannabis, but actually by doing things that are healthy in squeezing out naturally occurring cannabinoids from within your body. So there may be ways. That patient's coming in saying, you know, should I try cannabis? Well, you know what? There's a way you can try cannabis without actually using it at all. Go for a walk every morning. Go for a bit of a hike. You'll feel good. And that runner's high, that feeling of euphoria that athletes report getting when they've been doing an exercise, turns out that this may be a cannabinoid-mediated effect rather than a, people talked about it as being endorphins. We now think that it's probably endogenous cannabinoid-related. And it has strong analgesic properties. Just in the last month, the National Academy of Sciences uh, engineering and medicine in the United States published a massive systematic review of the effects of cannabis and health. Um, it was a huge panel. It was an incredible body of work. Um, and I'm going to sort of conclude my considerations of cannabis and pain by showing you what they concluded about cannabis and pain. And this is January, 19, January 2017, and it's written across the top. There is conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for the treatment of chronic pain in adults, brackets, cannabis. And I don't know that there's a more august or revered body of scientists in the world than the National Academy of Sciences in the US. But for them to conclude that and put that forward tells me that the patients that told me they were using cannabis for their pain the Rasta man who told me that his pain was better when he used it. There's truth in those stories. And science has taken a little while to catch up. But the fact that there's now conclusive or substantive evidence means that the patient's stories were validated. We have prescription cannabinoids in Canadian pharmacies. And I put this up to show you that patient stories have been validated in other areas, not just pain. Dronabinol, THC or Marinol, was approved in the mid-1980s for the treatment of nausea, uh, sorry, with the treatment of anorexia associated with HIV AIDS. Patients with AIDS were dying because they couldn't eat, they were nauseous, uh, and they weren't feeding. And ca cannabis had this appetite-stimulating effect. The drug was approved because of pressure from patients to have access to cannabis for appetite stimulation. So this drug was kind of rushed through the system and made available in order to give patients access to THC to improve their, nausea, their appetite and their nausea. Uh, so patients generating change which leads to medication development. Uh, nabilone for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It's no secret in any oncology ward that some patients step outside when they're about to have their chemo, smoke a few puffs of a joint, come back in and can tolerate the chemotherapy. It doesn't make them throw up. Very, very highly noxygenic. Um, and nabilone was developed, again, similar thing, get cannabinoids available, rushed through and approved based on the fact that they needed something for these patients. And then more recently, nabiximols, a spray containing THC and CBD, approved because there was pressure in the UK from multiple sclerosis patients to have access to cannabis for their spasticity. So drug company hears this, goes back to the drawing board, develops a medicine, and gets it approved for the condition. So patient stories, being validated by medicines that are developed to treat the conditions that they told us that they were using them for. We talk a lot about evidence in medicine. Um, there's a hierarchy of evidence. And at the very top of it is the document that we saw from the National Academy of Science, the systematic review. It took all the literature and looks through it and parses it out and ranks it by quality, rates the studies by evidence, and then comes up with a conclusion. And so we've had very, very high levels of support from the randomized control trials, systematic reviews that suggest that cannabis and pain, uh, cannabis is, is uh, there's good evidence that it's effective in the treatment of chronic pain. But I want to show you what's at the bottom of the, of the pyramid. 
case reports. The whole pyramid is built on anecdotes and stories and patient reports. We have to start climbing from there up to this case series, like the 15 patients that I showed you earlier, to the descriptive studies, which is kind of like the compass study that I showed you. We're describing changes up to the cohorts, the control trials, and the reviews. This is a long ladder to climb, and it takes time, it takes money, it takes incredible effort and energy to fight against some of the barriers that we encounter when we're trying to study drugs like this. Um, but it's very rewarding when you reach the top and you see a statement, you know, 20 years after you started studying cannabis for pain, that it's now considered to have substantive and conclusive evidence. But efficacy and whether it works or not is only one part of the story. Safety is another one. It's a preoccupation of many people. Is it going to make me go psychotic? Is it going to make me tr crash my car? Is it going to make me do something, interact with my medications? Um, so. Safety issues is actually kind of an inverted pyramid. Clinical trials and RCTs are lousy at safety because people are using it under such controlled conditions. They've been selected out so that they have a minimum likelihood of having complications. You don't recruit people with very severe psychological disorders and so on. They want a nice clean population. And yes, you measure the adverse events, but it's usually a short period of time. Where you get the biggest safety signals are from clinical observations, patient stories. We hear patients coming in telling us that they've developed nausea, and the only thing that gets better is when they have a shower, the, the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It's all anecdotes. Nobody's studied it or done a trial. The opioid epidemic that we're hearing about, these are one by one, sadly, hundreds of cases. Nobody needs to do a trial to tell you that there's an opioid epidemic. Safety comes from observation. And so from that perspective, I think that the clinical anecdote and the story is crucial. But what we do is we take that information and we put it through the process of scientific observation. Why is that happening? What's causing that side effect? How do we go back and reduce it, minimize it? Uh, and so we take it back down the pyramid. I'm, I'm nearly finished, and I'm looking forward to a discussion about some of these topics. But I want to also throw a little bit of light on the fact that the lens through which we study drugs like cannabis can also distort the picture. And this won't be a, a mystery to you. Uh, but I love this quote that I found. I was reading a paper, and I don't remember the original paper that I read it, but I took the quote and I copied it down. And I'll read it out. But perhaps, since I was talking about truth, true facts and correct methods of measurement are as much an outcome of policy as they are an influence upon it. And I want to sort of suggest to you that the reason why we've spent so many years studying the harms of cannabis is because the policy was set up to have it as a prohibit, prohibited substance. It was illegal to possess. All the efforts that went into measuring cannabis were designed to measure harm. All the studies that were done were done to design to predominate to, to find harm. But over the last 20 years, we've started to see an opening to the fact that these drugs could have potential benefits. So we're changing the methods of administration, we're changing the methods of measurements, and perhaps the truth that we're seeing now is influenced by the changes in policy as much as it is by the truth of the drug or the truth of the reaction. And I'm going to conclude with something that actually occurred to me this morning. I was on a rowing machine at the hotel, boosting my endocannabinoid levels. And I was thinking, how am I going to wrap up this talk? And I thought of a, you know, some little phrase that I could use. And, and I think I'll leave this with you. But uh, the idea of looking for the truth about cannabis, I'd be wary of anybody that says that they've got it figured out. Be wary of anybody that says, we know that this is true about cannabis. There are colors and spectra everywhere in this story. And I think we're getting closer to the truth. But I put it to you that really, when we're getting close to the truth about cannabis, it's when the stories and the science are coming together telling us the same thing. Patients are telling us this on the one hand, the science is supporting it and measuring it and saying, you know what, looks like that's happening. When those things are happening, we're getting to the truth. And for those of you who are crazy about truth and, tell truth and storytelling, um, this is a Japanese haiku, 17 syllable short story. Uh, and I'd like to leave you with that, uh, thinking about the importance of both story and science. Uh, I'll be, just end by thanking, uh, there were way too many people, and it's conventional at the end of scientific talks to thank all your collaborators, and I couldn't possibly do that for 20 years of research.
But I do want to thank two things. One, my genetics, my family for giving me the Jamaican beach in the first place, um, and my brother who, who, who are, with whom I have an amazing relationship. Uh, and my environment, the labs, the people that, the Phil Gold, the people that helped to make these research possible, uh, all the people that worked at every level that I've been involved in have been incredibly helpful and supportive and, and helping to move this forward. So with a sort of broad nod to genetics and to the environment and a reminder of the beaches, uh, I'll thank you, my present immediate environment, for having shared some time with me, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Excellent. We have time for questions. That was a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, so I have a few questions. I'll read some of the important ones. So out of the studies that uh, seems like that you have done are through smoking cannabis, for, right, for, for example. So uh, other than the THC, through your studies, have you found any other cannabinoids that are sufficient or you know, can match up the pain management as THC? So I, I think I anticipated this question when I said that we haven't had a chance to look at CBD yet, which is obviously the other cannabinoid that's driving a lot of the interest in cannabinoid medicine now. Uh, no, is the quick answer. We've All we've been able to access is cannabis products that are varied in the level of THC. Okay. Uh, we're beginning now to do studies with different levels of other cannabinoids, but before you ask me about acids and the terpenes, and, and yes, we haven't begun to explore the input of those particular products yet in pain management. I see, okay, thanks. And just another one. So you mentioned that 25 milligrams of, say, 9.4% 9, uh, 9 of the THC, and that's pretty efficient for uh, suppressing pain, and that's obviously through smoking, I take it as, right? So, and if, say, if the patient is being administrated, uh, you know, cannabinoids or cannabis through your digestive tract, and then with this uh, total dosage needs to be increased significantly because you get all these enzymes to degrading the enzymes, or sorry, the cannabinoids down until it reaches the brain. So have you ever done studies to um, study, for example, how much it's going to take to administrate it in other, you know, methods? Because obviously smoking, you're pretty much excluding a lot of the patient populations. Definitely you're wiping out the entire pediatric population, for sure. example. Yeah. Yeah. So we're beginning to do vaporizer studies now, and I mentioned some of them earlier. Um, so we're beginning to look at non-smoke delivery systems. Uh, we have a study that we're beginning now with oils and oral administration, and you're quite right that the method of administration changes very much the pharmacology of the drug. It's absorbed more slowly, the effects are much longer. That acute onset that I showed you with the smoke study does not apply to an orally administered cannabinoid. Um, I, whether we've done comparative studies to what levels of oral administration, I, I don't, we don't have direct head-to-heads, uh, but most of the oral cannabinoid studies have suggested that doses of around 2.5 milligrams seem to be orally the minimum level of medicine that you need to get a therapeutic effect. I, I, I would love to see studies of smaller doses because I really believe that a lot's happening at the low dose end, but the current medicines that are available are minimum doses of 2.5 milligrams per dose. Gotcha. Just one last question. So, would you say the interest of physicians or clinicians nowadays to conduct cannabinoid-based research would be, you know, people would be more interested in if I could have a way to access affordable and, uh, um, you know, plant-derived um, phytocannabinoids and to study these compounds individually at a pharmaceutical grade, and that would be a big help to the entire, you know, clinical trials of this in industry? I think what physicians would really like is to have good information on dosing and how to advise patients to introduce the drug and what dose to start with and how to adjust it. I think at the moment we're missing significant amounts of good information on how to interpret, you know, what is a 12% THC strain and a puff versus a, an oil that has so, so many you know, milligrams per milliliter. Doctors don't have the information needed yet to give that kind of dosing information. So I think that's, whether it's herbally derived or synthetic, that, that's the language that physicians would wish to speak. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. So, no. My name's Leo. Um, <clears throat> I work for uh, the Kettle Society, and um, I work with people to help house um, people with mental health and addictions. And I've seen a lot of, um, you know, things like insight and all this harm reduction stuff, but uh, I have a friend 
who, who's a very close friend of mine, actually, who just relapsed um, from crack. And I showed him away um, with a glass crack pipe, because I, I get harm reduction supplies. And I, was, I said, hey, you'll try to sell. And I gave him shatter, you know, hippie crack, <laughs> right? And he was like, yo, this stuff is really good. Like, I feel like I'm smoking crack right now. And I was like, yeah, that's dope, because it's hippie crack, but it's not crack, <laughs> you know? And um, he was really happy with it, because the high was um, sustained. He felt euphoric. He had that crack high. Like, I wish I could, I know what that is, but I don't. That's not my thing, you know? So, um, yeah, I just want to know, is there any research that's going to move forward um, in harm reduction with using things like shatter and other things to ease off that? So, yeah, great question. I, I think it's evolving. I think the stories that we're hearing about people substituting cannabis for opioids, substituting right. it for other drugs, alcohol, uh, the fact that we're seeing patients coming in with pain and reducing the, the level of their opioids, mm -hmm. uh, we need to take that seriously. Yeah. What we don't have is this formal trials to show if somebody's coming in, say, right. and who's, you know, who's addicted to crack, mm -hmm. what's the dose of that product that you right. described that I should be giving and how often? And for that to kind of go mainstream, we mm -hmm. need a little bit more material to work mm -hmm. with. And, and yeah. those stories are powerful because mm -hmm. what I hear from you is that they need a very potent cannabis. Like maybe those, yep. those individuals <laughs> wouldn't respond to a 5% you know, THC. We were having this discussion earlier. Do you need yeah. to substitute with a very high potency? We don't know. We can guess and we could look at potential ways to do it. Unfortunately, in moving above 12% THC, we're only just now getting access to herbal and oil strains that have larger levels of THC. But getting into the concentrates, we don't have access to those materials for clinical research at this time. Right, right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd love to do research on my own, just because I got a lot of people who I could help. Um, but also, another question. Um, I myself am, am using this as medication, um, cannabis. Um, I have this weird involuntary leg twitch. <clears throat> I fell on my hip skateboarding and it hasn't been the same since. And doctors are prescribing, you know, things like muscle relaxants. And, and from my experiences, I just, I get really lethargic from that. And my life evolves around like waking up early <clears throat> for my morning practice. You know, I'm also a yoga instructor. So I'm a busy cat, you know what I mean? I can't be like taking this pill and being like, okay, so today, you know what I'm saying? Um, so is there a strain you can recommend for me that will keep me going? I was wait, waiting for that part of your question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't even dare to recommend anything to you in a form uh, like this for your, for your, for your pain. I, I, yes. I hear you. Uh, I think you, you, know, you need to hear me and the need to understand how the pain affects you, what you've done, what you need to do. Uh -huh. You need, you know, somebody to give you much more advice than just, you know, try so, a little so, bit so. of Indica. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's not going to so fly much. in my book. Awesome. Okay. But thanks, thanks for, for the story. Thanks for sharing. Next uh, question. Yes, go ahead. So it's not a question. I just want to back him up and let him know that he's right. So I've been smoking for 36 years, pretty much every day, unless I'm out of the country and can't, can't get access. I'm a high-functioning stoner. So um, I, way, way back in the day, in the 70s, early 80s, I did crack a couple times. And he's right. He's absolutely right. So I tried, um, I tried dabs, and I tried shatter. And I don't like it because it's exactly, I told my husband, I said, it's, to me, it's the uh, crack of cannabis. And it gives me uh, that really fast, that I am not comfortable with. So I vape, I've been vaping for three and a half years. Um, I've, so I've been smoking some joints lately, but I don't like it. I like the vape, it's a different uh, thing for me. My doctor told me as long as I'm vaping, I'm good. I use it for pain and I use it for recreational and I've been self, I'm using it for self-medicating. And until six months ago, I didn't really know the difference between any strains because I was in the closet. And for the last six months, I have felt a huge change because I'm out of the closet. It's weird. I come from a very, very strict Catholic background where I was never allowed to, to share or to tell anything. Last February, my mother 
was diagnosed, or it was the doctor, the oncologist, gave her cannabis because she was going to die from the chemo. So my sister called me. They took her off the chemo. I hadn't been able to talk to her for five months because she couldn't get on the phone. She was getting from the bed to the, her, to the bathroom, and she f had fallen five times. So they took her off. A month later, I called the house, and someone answered the phone, and I was like, who is this? And my mom said, what are you talking about, Colleen? It's mom. And I didn't recognize her voice. And so, because my 83-year-old mom was safe, you know, has been brought back, and she hasn't gone back on chemo, she's not doing it anymore, but because it brought her back, you can't imagine, she actually gets out of bed, she can go to restaurants, she is eating, it, you, you, you can't, she was done. And my dad, two months after the cannabis, she started on it, my 86-year-old conservative dad, who is Mr. What are you talking about, dope, said to me, why isn't this for sale in every store? I do not understand. So that young man needs to know that his interpretation of how it can help somebody and the difference in the level of drugs. And when I saw your opiate slide, I'm going to social media that out that, like, you have no idea. Like, that's what Trump needs to see, right? Like, that's it. This is what it's all about. And we all need to make sure that Trump gets a hold of this and that it, we just shove it at him. Because everybody needs to understand it has been studied. And I'm sorry that the scientific community hasn't had the opportunity to study it. But you know who has? The human race. So you guys, I've been to every lecture. There are two more left. I'm 56 years old. And I'm telling you that you guys need to take it from a different place. And instead of you studying it and telling us how to use it, you're right, you need to listen to the stories and interpret from that how it works. Because somebody in one of the meetings said, well, we're going to study it, and then we're going to tell you how to, how to use it. And I thought, right, you're going to tell me after 36 years how to use my dope? I don't think so. Good luck with that. Anyway, I love the study. I thought your talk was amazing. Thank you. And I really, really appreciated it. Thank you, Thank you very much. It. All right. We'll, uh, we'll take a couple more questions, and then, and then, as usual, we do have food and drinks outside, so we'll start with you, because you were up there. Thank you. Um, so, I really love where this just went, because um, where I had a question. You had answered it uh, about this, um, the THC uh, case studies that you guys have been this far educating and learning and researching. And of course, this is all a whole new era of life that is becoming acceptable, and we're moving forward, and it's going to take time. This isn't going to be overnight. My own mother has uh, fibromyalgia, very severe fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, lupus, and she's 63 years old in a 90-year-old body. I am a pastry chef. Um, I've learned how to activate decarboxylate oil, and I'm trying to offer different methods that way to help her, but yet I'm her daughter. So, and I'm only, uh, I can only get access in certain ways right now without growing my own to be the, um, my, our own test, you know, subjects. I'm my mother's daughter. I feel pains, but I'm not her era. So, and fibromyalgia is even a new um, uh, accepted, dis you know, dis disease or disorder. So that being said, there's a lot of time to develop. So I'm working already now on my own and with uh, rheumatology rheumatologist uh, doctor here to say, let's regulate, let's watch and see how I grow and use me as a case study. But he is only one person in a small bubble. And, you know, we, like you say, the doctors don't even know yet because we don't know. So where I want to cap this with everybody here is that we have an opportunity that we are doing stuff like this other gentleman. He has people. Would you be interested if we could somehow, I'm asking this of you, if you could create um, an area, an online, some, some area, it doesn't have to be legally, you know, um, documented to that highest level of certification, but this could help you. The, the, and then with the euphoria effect, 
and people with severe ailments that teach the, the, the euphoria doesn't really, it, it monitor, everybody regulates differently, right? So if, you're, if you've only done THC, we're, we're learning about the CBD aspects and that's where we're at so far, but what, let's unify, like bring everybody together in a way that we can all add to it and at least whether it's acceptable to the bigger picture, you know, this could be a side thing that's, do you, do you know what I mean? I hope I'm expressing this properly um, for you guys to understand, but I think that we have an opportunity that we can help bring and give, give you this information needed as we grow. Um, my mom herself, I'd love if you could even, she could be a test um, case study with you. She's, I, it's every day she's in so much, I just, I can't help her fast enough. And she's stubborn, she's been taking cannabis for my whole life. You know, and it's just not enough. She needs truckloads. So maybe, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll just yeah. Know, I'll ask you this because but there will be other people that have questions and yeah. stories. Uh, I hear you very powerfully. Uh, are there methods that we can capture that kind of information in a way that's meaningful? And like it, forums. The, and, yeah. yeah. So there are there are websites out there that capture patient information. Patients like me. There are places that people can go and enter stuff. It's not done under the same level of rigor that we would have to do to get scientific studies published and may need approvals and ethics. And it's a tremendously complicated process to get a paper formally published because you need to be clear that the methods that you used were, were appropriate. But I, I, there's room for that. And, and there are yeah. places to publish case reports. There are places to work with, uh, with communities and get these stories captured. I uh, so they are out there. there. Yeah, sorry, I figured there would be. I just felt like if we could bring it into one hub yeah. That would be amazing, and that would accelerate our changes a lot faster than a slow pace. Thank you. Thank thanks. you for your time. Yep, thank you. We'll go over there for a question, and then okay, we'll thanks. Come back Hi, here. thank you so much for your talk. That was awesome. Um, my question is more like when you showed all those studies that there was like um, a large density of studies that had started in the 2000s. I'm wondering like sort of why that is, and um, if other countries and other places in the world have been doing studies long before that maybe we could have access to? Or is it just North America that experienced like a sudden boom in research? It's pretty much North America and Europe as the predominant. The South America was big with epilepsy research. In fact, researchers in Brazil in the early 1980s were first studying CBD for epilepsy and publishing it. So that story for CBD and epilepsy has been around for a lot longer than people realize. But it kind of got buried and it hasn't been rediscovered until recently. Uh, but predominantly it's been the US, Canada and Europe have been the major leading sites in taking this forward and probably because they have access to the study materials. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Dr. Weir, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, I'd like to ask you, I'm very focused on different delivery methods. Um, it seems to me that the regulatory authorities, particularly Health Canada, continually focus on smoking or vaporizing when they continually reinforce the fact that one or two grams a day is an average. But different delivery methods require significant increases in those numbers. How do we educate Health Canada and perhaps the colleges of physicians and surgeons and the CMA to understand that these different methods that may not even be available through licensed producers there are other products and there are other de delivery methods that require much larger grams per day per patient. How do we educate these, these institutions? Well, in a perfect world, policy is educated by science. So you want to have access to data that you can show how that increased quantity of product is being used and how it's, being, how it's required for patients to, to use. So far, the, the, the literature that's been studied, the number of grams that people use on average per day in Canada is you know, less than one gram a day by purchase or around one gram a day. Our studies were two. So requests and authorizations for 30 grams, 60 grams per day, those are outside of that sort of normal curve. And there's a lot of questions about what that, how is that being used? Is it being concentrated and put into oral or foods? Is it being diverted? And as long as those question marks remain and there isn't good data on which to build a policy to expand the dosing, uh, it will probably remain as frustrating as, as you feel it is. So the quick answer is you know, good quality data on how larger quantities are being used and, and why. Okay, we'll take one more and then we'll, we'll break. Thank you for the awesome lecture. Uh, just a quick question regarding the opioid use and cannabis, probably how it works. Uh, was it 
tested against methadone ever as a substitute for methadone, or as a plan to test it against methadone? I don't think it's really been studied formally as a substitute in any opioid. It, these are stories that you hear from patients reporting having done this, but actually prospectively showing that patients on opioids or methadone, when given cannabis, can, can be reduced. Those kinds of formal studies haven't been done. Um, there were really good animal studies, and one of the reasons why I think we need to take this so seriously is that there's a very interesting interaction between the opioid and cannabinoid receptor. So we have opioid receptors in much the same areas that we have cannabinoid receptors, and they actually talk to each other. So when you're on a cannabinoid and an opioid together, there's actually an intriguing interaction that's happening between the two, which allows you to use much lower levels, and this is coming again from the animal literature, but it supports what we hear in humans, that you can use much lower doses of both drugs to get the same kind of analgesic effect, so the synergistic. Um, and this may be true in humans, it just hasn't been properly studied. Again, we're hearing the stories and we're trying to move forward with that kind of research. But at the moment, you know, whether substituting for fentanyl or methadone or oxycodone, we, we don't have enough information to prospectively put that through. Thank you. Thank you.